Emily Luhan was born in Manhattan, New York in 1901, where she grew up with her three brothers and two sisters. Not much is known about her childhood, but by 1928, she was in New Jersey exchanging vows with novice Boomhauer, a man who would grow to be an extremely successful linoleum businessman. The pair put down roots in an affluent area of Los Angeles in a Bel Air mansion located at 701 Nimes Road. Although they never had children, they had no trouble filling their 10 separate bedrooms with their many symbols of wealth. Over the years of their marriage, Mr. Boomhauer would go on exotic hunting safaris. As an experienced hunter, he never came home empty-handed and quickly began adorning the walls of the mansion with his taxidermy mounts. No stranger to hunting, Emily herself scored impressive kills and enjoyed the safaris just as much as novice did. Emily, or Mimi as her loved ones called her, wasn't the typical wife one would expect when imagining a wealthy businessman living high in Bel Air. She was reported to be somewhat unattractive by society standards with her short stature and plump figure. Even so, the Boomhauer seemed to spend many happy years together, collecting big game trophies and attending some of Los Angeles's most exclusive social events. In 1943, Mr. Boomhauer died from unknown reasons at the age of 58, leaving Mimi a 42-year-old widow. As the years went on, the loss of her husband didn't seem to slow her down. She maintained her very active social life, going on dates and keeping her calendar full with events throughout the city. Although she dated after novice died, she never seemed to find another man who could fill the role of her husband. She seemed perfectly content living life on her own, even earning herself the nickname The Merry Widow, largely in part to her happy-go-lucky demeanor. Over time, Mimi began expanding on the home's collections, but instead of big game trophies, she opted for something much more pleasing to her own eye, diamonds and jewelry. It seemed maintaining appearances was important to her, and she worked hard to preserve her image of wealth and status in the community. While everyone knew Mimi's birth year is 1901, some records show an exact birth date of June 3, 1896, suggesting Mimi herself may have shaved off a few years to appear younger and more appealing. In the late summer of 1949, Mimi was making a routine trip to her furrier. After spending time in the shop and trying on various furs, Mimi told the owner she needed to consult with her husband before making the purchase. But Novice had been dead for six years. Mimi quickly corrected herself and explained since it was such a big purchase, she was going to speak with her siblings before committing to the new fur. Mimi spent the evening talking with a friend on the phone sometime between 7 and 8 o'clock. Her original plans for the night, dinner with her friend Stella Hunter, were canceled by Mimi the day before. She told Stella something had come up, but didn't specify what that was. It sounded as though she did overbook herself for that night, because when she saw her business manager earlier in the day, she told him she had a meeting with a gentleman scheduled for that evening. She promised him she would call him when the meeting ended at 8.30. But that call never came. Stella and another friend of Mimi's met police officers at the Bel Air mansion after Stella wasn't able to get a hold of Mimi for several days. All of the lights seemed to be on inside of the house, and they found Mimi's 1941 sedan sitting in her garage, yet there was still no sign of her. The front door was locked, but after they were able to get inside, Mimi didn't answer when they called out for her. They began walking throughout the mansion and found a big salad sitting on her kitchen table, completely untouched. An evening dress was thrown across the bed in her bedroom, and a cryptic postcard sat waiting in her mailbox. Olga gave me your news. Lillian. Investigators contacted Olga, one of Mimi's sisters who was living in New York. When asked about the postcard and her sister's whereabouts, Olga told them she didn't know anyone named Lillian and was completely stumped over the supposed news. She had no idea what any of it meant. Four miles away from Mimi's mansion, a phone booth sat outside of a grocery store on Wilshire Boulevard. A white calfskin purse was left inside which was confirmed to be Mimi's. The purse contained her driver's license, credit card, car and house keys, a makeup compact, and her lipstick. On the outside of the purse was a message written in ink. Police Department, we found this at Beach Thursday night. Thursday was August 18th, the last time anyone had seen or heard from Mimi Boomhauer. Officers did note something even more interesting about the purse. There was no sign of sand or water in or on the purse, leaving them to believe it never was anywhere near the beach. Law enforcement continued to speak with Olga, going over some of Mimi's last known movements and interactions before her disappearance on the 18th. When Olga was told about Mimi's trip to her furrier, 
Olga was once again left speechless. Mimi had never consulted with Olga nor any of their siblings over any of her purchases, no matter how big or small. She had never claimed before that she needed approval from anyone when spending money. She had plenty of it. At least, that's what she led everyone to believe. Mr. Boomhauer was known for his passion for hunting. His collection of trophies was estimated to be about $300,000 at the time, equivalent to just under $4 million in 2024. Although Novice had been gone for six years, Mimi held on to all of his prizes. But when she disappeared, investigators saw she had been slowly selling off his pieces, one by one, for a fraction of their worth. After buying one of Novice's elephant heads from Mimi, one buyer discovered the elephant's ivory tusks had been replaced with cheap plaster, drastically reducing its value. Mimi had also made secret financial deals, taking out a $5,000 home loan and pawning a $3,000 watch for only $100, leaving everyone to presume she needed money, and quickly. After rumors began to surface that she had social ties to a local mobster, Tony the Hat Cornero, the community began to wonder if she had been hiding a serious gambling addiction. Cornero owned floating casinos that were docked right off the Southern California coast, and just days before she disappeared, it was reported she was seen at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel with one of Cornero's men, Tom Evans. When authorities questioned Evans, he did admit he frequented the bar at the hotel, but he had no idea who Mimi was and insisted he was never with her. Two months after Mimi's disappearance, Evans was questioned in the disappearance of another Los Angeles area woman, Jean Spangler, but he again denied having any connection to this woman either. If Mimi really didn't have ties to dangerous mobsters in the gambling world, authorities posed the idea of Mimi trying to secure a new, wealthy husband. If she misrepresented her wealth, her new suitor may have killed her in a fit of rage. But where was her body? And who was this potential lover? Mimi had never spoken of any new relationships or was seen with any one man who would raise suspicions of this scenario. As authorities continued to interview those who knew her, her gardener revealed he had seen an older gentleman watching Mimi's house the week before her disappearance. He described seeing a man with white hair in a very expensive car, just sitting in the neighbor's driveway watching the Boomhauer home. Police weren't able to find the mystery man and chalked it up to an unrelated or untrue situation. Travel pamphlets were found throughout the house, with one in particular being a health resort in Mexico. After taking inventory of her possessions, investigators believed Mimi was wearing upwards of $25,000 worth of jewelry and fur when she disappeared. It would make sense that Mimi put on some of her favorite jewelry before leaving, as she always did. But why was a freshly made salad left in her kitchen? A dress was left lying on top of her bed. Her car was locked and safely tucked away in her garage. No local taxi companies had any record of picking up a passenger from her address the night she disappeared. So what happened that night after she hung up with her friend at 8 o'clock that prevented her from calling her business manager at 8.30, as promised? Eleven days after Mimi was last heard from, a judge legally declared her dead at the request of her attorney. At the time, the law in California required at least 90 days to pass before a missing person could be declared deceased, but Mimi's attorney insisted he needed the ruling in order to have access to Mimi's assets. He was concerned about her mortgage and any outstanding debts that lingered. Almost immediately, he began selling off pieces of her estate. The estate was initially appraised at $64,796, with $40,000 of that being the estimated sale price of her home and a mere $5,000 in assets. Just months after declaring her dead, the same judge took back his ruling in November of 1949. Still, the family attorney continued to manage her finances, but by 1956, her total estate had dropped down to $619.46 in cash and $25,000 in government bonds, equivalent to a $568,000 loss today. Her small remainder was given to her siblings. Mimi undoubtedly was struggling with her finances, more than she ever let on. Was pride keeping her secrets hidden? Or was something, or someone, threatening her to the point where she had to move quickly. Before she vanished, Mimi was in the process of trying to sell her expansive Bel Air home. Although it was worth $75,000 at the time, she wanted to let it go for $65,000, a pretty substantial loss. Was she pricing it low for a quick sale? In February of 1948, Gladys Kern, a local real estate agent, 
was showing a home at 4217 Cromwell Avenue in the Los Feliz area of Los Angeles. Her body was found two days later, left on the kitchen floor, with an expensive diamond watch missing from her wrist. Many wondered if Mimi was met with the same fate. She had a very small gap of time between the end of the phone call with her friend to the time she was supposed to call her business manager. Could she have taken it upon herself to privately show her home to this unidentified gentleman? She could have set up that 8.30 phone call with the hopes of discussing a potential bid on her home if her brief meeting went well. Even though Mimi disappeared just one day shy of the sixth anniversary of her husband's passing, her loved ones didn't believe she could have taken her own life as some speculated. She had earned her Merry Widow title around town due to her upbeat personality. She never gave the impression she was depressed or that she suddenly couldn't live without novice. My father was Dr. George Hodell. He was a famous physician. He was also the prime suspect and the killer of Elizabeth Short, better known as the Black Dahlia. Steve Hodell has dedicated many years into investigating what would be an impossible task for most, establishing a connection between unsolved murders with his own father. In the year 2000, handwriting expert Hannah McFarland took a look at the writing found on the outside of Mimi's purse with the postcards mailed by the suspected killer of the Black Dahlia. After studying and comparing dozens of samples, she concluded there is a high probability the writing on the purse and at least four of the Black Dahlia postcards were written by the same person, Dr. George Hodel. Although the 1947 Black Dahlia murder remains officially unsolved, many law enforcement officials suspected Dr. Hodel was behind it. Without enough evidence to formally charge him, Dr. Hodel continued to live out the rest of his life until 1999 when he died at the age of 91. Mimi Boomhauer's fate remains a mystery. Did her life of wealth and glamour conceal darker secrets that ultimately led to her demise? Or was she an unwitting victim of a more sinister force? 75 years later, we're no closer to the truth. But one thing is clear. Whatever happened that night in August 1949, Mimi took the answers with her. <laughs>